Hello, and welcome to the Telia Carrier and Internet Society September Virtual Roundtable, Cyber Attacks and How the Right Network Can Be Your Best Defense. I'm your host, Laura Noland, and joining me today are Matthias Friedstrom, Chief Evangelist at Telia Carrier, and Andre Robachevsky, Senior Director of Technology Programs at the Internet Society. We're going to welcome our panelists in just a moment, but first, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. We want to make sure this virtual roundtable is as interactive as possible, so please add any questions that you might have into the Q&A box. If you have any other comments, please feel free to add them into the chat box and we'll take a look for them. We will do our best to address all of the questions at the end of the hour. Now, if you don't have time to get to your questions, our panelists will follow up with you directly. Also, I'd like to take a moment to now to ask the panelists to introduce themselves. So if each of you could give a brief introduction and explain your role and the role your company plays in the industry as it relates to today's topic. So let's start with you, Matthias. Yeah, thank you very much, Laura, for having me. Uh, I'm Matthias Fridström. Uh, I'm currently the chief evangelist at Telia Carrier. Uh, I used to be the CTO for many, many years, but have the last couple of years spent my time as the chief evangelist, really trying to understand what the market needs from carriers, service providers like us, and also what we need to do to please the market, really. So security is dear to my heart, and, and I'm really curious to be here and discuss with you. Wonderful. Andre, how about you? Thank you, Laura. Yes, I'm Andrei Robachevsky, uh, Senior Director for Technology Programs at the Internet Society. The uh, Internet Society is a mission-driven uh, organization, global organization, striving for the uh, open, globally connected, secure transport of the internet for everyone. And uh, um, I've been in the internet industry for almost 30 years, uh, from building networks to dealing with techno-policy issues, but I'm, I'm by nature a technologist, uh, my main focus on, on internet infrastructure, security, resilience, um, particularly working on issues that border with governance and policy. Uh, I was at the birth of the industry-led initiative supported by the Internet Society called Mutually Agreed Norms for Routing Security Manners, something that is very much relevant to the topic we're discussing today. Wonderful. Great to know both of you. And we've got a lot to cover today, so let's jump right into our first question. Can you define cyber attacks and the different aspects of internet security, apps versus network security? So Andre, I'd like to toss that one to you first. Thank you, Laura. Um, well, let me start that to saying the internet is a very complex ecosystem. It's a network of network and there are indeed numerous facets of security. Internet architecture is based on a layered model when underlying layers provide common functionality for upper layers. Um, think of uh, like a network function responsible for moving packets from uh, one point to another, while uh, application layer is mostly concerned uh, about exchanging structured data between two or more applications. Um, this is, of course, a simplification to think of uh, the internet as a layer cake, but it gives an idea. Uh, what that means is that applications can be developed without much concern for the underlying network technology. And networks can be deployed and operate across different media like DSL or fiber or satellite. But there is no security layer there. And that is for the reason because for each of those components, for each of those layers, uh, threat and risk assessment should be performed separately and security solutions should be developed. This is why for each of those technology building blocks, um, that ITF is developing. ITF stands for the Internet Engineering Task Force, one of the main uh, standard development organizations for the core internet standards. There is a special section in each of the specifications called uh, security considerations. That is what uh, in security jargon called security defense in depth. Well, case in point illustrating uh, these complex dependencies and the need for security solutions for each of the component is an um, incident that happened a couple of years ago, um, which resulted in emptying uh, Ethereum crypto wallets. Uh, the attack involved route hijacking to enable impersonation of the main name system resolution to enable redirection to fake version of the website, my either wallet. 
And it demonstrated that vulnerability at each layer was uh, exploited, including social engineering when users were um, sort of tricked into fake um, website certificates, accepting them and leading to the web, uh, a fake website. So if you ask me up versus network, I would say both are important. But because the, uh, the security gaps and core infrastructure provide a broader platform for launching attacks, and even circumventing higher layer security solutions, I would say probably that would be uh, uh, requires more focus and it actually more challenging. Matthias, would you like to weigh in on this too? No, I think Andrew covered it really well. I think, you know, there are many different ways of cyber attacks. Uh, I think we will discuss quite a few of them here uh, as we as a carrier is obviously more focused on the network side of this, but of course any cyber attack can happen both on the application application layer and network layer, they're both important in combination. Matthias, while I have you on the hot seat, let me start with this next question with you. How do cyber attacks happen? And then what is the market saying? Are, are cyber attacks becoming more common? Yeah, I think that's a good question really. And of course there are many, many different cyber attacks as Andre talked about, you know, you can attack the applications, you can attack, you can send phishing emails and, and there are many ways of it. I would much sort of focus on the network side because that's where we are strong and that's where we believe we can add some value here. And, and on the network side, I would argue that the DDoS attacks are by far the most uh, important ones to stop and, and where most attacks are. DDoS attacks for those people that don't really know are, are coming in two ways really. One of them is sort of the persistent low intensity attack where you, by attacking one target with question after question after question, could be very small questions, but you're just sending a question, a question, and you never really answer. And, and at, sort of at the end of the day, the server gives up because they've been asked and, and it's overloaded in terms of memory and so on. And the other one is really where you collect a lot of sites on the internet and you attack one site with large volumes. You just pour on data into one site, causing that site to pretty much go down. So those are really the two ones and the DDoS. And if you ask me what, if, if these are common, uh, you, you know, we did a survey right before the summer this year among 400 enterprises, both in US and in Europe. And 78% of the companies we surveyed said that they had been attacked more than 100 times already this year. And 68% of them said that they've been under DDoS attacks. So I would say, yes, these attacks are very common. Uh, we also asked them, you know, if they've seen an increase during the pandemic and actually half of them said they have seen an increase. A third of them said they hadn't seen an increase, but, but more, almost, almost half of them said they've seen an increase. So yeah, this is a big problem for the internet and something we all need to work about to get out. Wow, those are some shocking statistics. I appreciate you sharing with us today. So we're going to start now to talk more about when those cyber attacks happen. So what happens when they're successful and they do break through and why are they successful? Andre, can you start with that? Yeah, of course. Um, well, Matthias already mentioned types of attack that happen. And yes, if we look at infrastructure, denial of service attacks are most common and quite easy to mount, in fact. So let me uh, sort of reflect a little bit on why those attacks are successful. And I think success of those attacks is mostly linked to the challenge of addressing security gaps in the internet infrastructure. So while many of the vulnerabilities and even technology solutions are known for decades, little is done to close them down. And one of the main reasons are negative externalities, so-called uh, when course of security gaps um, are not incurred by negligent entities when the cost of the damages occurring from those attacks are not incurred by the attacker or facilitator. Uh, well, I take one example that very close to my heart is routing security. And in fact, security of your own network um, depends on actions or inaction, if you will, by other network operators. There are about 70,000 network operators in or autonomous system in the global routing system. So there is a huge dependency and a huge externality where 
um, if I do nothing, I do not uh, uh, make my security of my network significantly worse, but at the same time, I'm not contributing to the global routing security. The same applies to open resolvers. Like those are the launch pads uh, for many of denial of service attack, volumetric attacks, and people operating those resolvers do not care, they're negligent, but they do not suffer from those denial of service attacks. And the same applies to other types of you know, uh, denial of service attack amplifiers. Um, networks allowing spoof traffic. One of the uh, uh, curse of the internet is uh, that routing or forwarding traffic doesn't depend on the um, uh, source IP address. Well, pretty much like in post office, when you send a mail, uh, your return address only matters when um, uh, mail cannot be delivered or you need someone to reply back to you. The same is here, but that creates uh, an opportunity to mount reflection and amplification denial of service attacks. Those who allow networks that allow spoof traffic, again, do not suffer from those denial of service attacks, but they are facilitating those. So this disconnect, I think it makes um, securing internet infrastructure so challenging. Oh, we, we've heard already about just the, the impact and the, and the large numbers of folks in the marketplace being victimized you know, by cyber threats and cyber attacks, and then the impact that it's causing businesses and, and companies. So is network security prioritized or overlooked by the market? Matthias, can you start with that? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, I don't think it's overlooked, and obviously it's becoming more common in news uh, on TV and other media where they talk about these attacks. I think more and more people are aware of this happening, but I still think many enterprises out there are still believing that, you know, really, as Andre said, you know, if we, if we don't do anything, let's keep our fingers crossed that nothing will happen. Uh, in our survey, when we asked them, you know, about 50% of them said that they are they are aware of what, what service providers could do for them and, and where they could get help but there is still half of them that didn't really have a good view of their protection. So I think, you know, there are many, many things enterprises can do much better here. Uh, I think some of them really get it. And I think the more they read about it, the more they are aware of the problems that this has if they are not protected. Uh, so I would say it's absolutely not overlooked, but it's also an area where I think each and every one of them can improve because there is many more things you can do uh, in, instead of just keeping your fingers crossed and hope that the attack will go to your neighbor and not to you. So uh, I don't think it's overlooked, but it can be much better. Andre, what do you think? Yeah, I, I largely agree with what Matthias said. Um, and um, another thing that I would like to mention that some of the uh, those attacks or some of the security measures, they have uh, not a very strong business case. And that's exactly what I just mentioned about those externalities that the costs of not doing something uh, are not uh, sort of buried by the by the negligent party. Um, so the there is also no, uh, no one uh, play alone can uh, close those vulnerabilities in such a decentralized and distributed system as the internet. Well, uh, this is a situation that is called in, in, in our social science, a collective action problem. Uh, everyone is uh, uh, striving, understands that uh, uh, they are better off with a more secure infrastructure. But due to conflicting priorities and this displacement of incentives, the organizations are very difficult to mobilize for the necessary collective action. And common goal is hard to achieve. I mean, look how some of the security technologies are uh, not very easily deployed uh, internet-wide, how long it takes to uh, security solutions to diffuse through the global internet. And that's partly because there is sort of not a very clear business case. It's not like uh, in, in sort of, you know, uh, uh, pre-internet security paradigm where you can build walls and secure your little fortress. Uh, this is not possible anymore. You're in open ocean and you need to work together with other entities. And related to this, I'd like to mention an industry-led initiative uh, uh, called Mutually Agreed Norms for Routing Security, I already mentioned in my introduction, which is, uh, uh, um, the acronym is MANUS. So we are looking for networks with good MANUS uh, that is supported by the Internet Society. Uh, it aims to overcome this collective action problem, right, that I just outlined, by developing common operational security practices into norms and building a grown community that can demonstrate adherence to those norms. 
Uh, so that's one of the approaches that we're promoting at the Internet Society, and that's something that can stimulate or mobilize community uh, for uh, long-term solutions. I'd like to dig a little deeper now. We talked about is network security prioritized or overlooked, but are people even aware of the role of the network in preventing malicious attacks, and then would that change that priority? Matthias, I'd like to start with you on this one. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. And I think, you know, sometimes um, when, when we talk to enterprise, it seems like they only think about their own premises and, and how to make sure that their own users have strong passwords and, and, and they have a nice firewall at the sort of entrance of the building. And that's it. So I, I sometimes feel that many enterprises don't really understand that there's a way you can you can work with your service provider and they can actually be your first line of defense. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of things we as a service provider can take away so that the enterprises never really see that type of traffic. Uh, so you're very right that many of them are, are feeling, you know, as long as we have a nice firewall, that's going to stop everything from entering our network and, and then we're safe. Uh, I actually think there is a lot of things the service providers can do here. And, and really, it's as Andre said, the internet is is something it's around 70,000 active networks out there and there are simply no rules on internet really because it's a trust-based network everyone has to trust trust each other and and of course 70,000 different people networks trusting each other that's difficult i think manners is a really good initiative we're obviously part of that we want to make the public internet much a much better place and much more safe but I think you know many enterprises needs to start to think about the network as well. If we can stop at least half of the attacks before they even reach the enterprise, it's going to be much more easier for them to handle their security. And sometimes I feel as long as they believe they have a nice firewall, they're safe. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, that's not going to help you. Uh, there are many ways for crooks and criminals to come around that. So, so combination of on-premises or in the cloud security and network security is a must in the future. Andre, what do you think? Well, the only thing I can add is uh, um, that a few years ago, we uh, conducted a study together with an uh, analyst company, 451 Research, and we looked how sort of the attitude towards routing security in particular from the enterprise level. And what we found is that um, one of the most challenging things in IT security for enterprise is selection of their service providers and especially in connectivity providers. One of the challenges in security is the uh, ability or rather lack of uh, uh, to signal your security posture. Uh, so when an enterprise selects a provider, it's like, well, uh, how do we know that you provide this extra security things? Um, so. We were thinking that Manus and still think that Manus can add this uh, signaling mechanism. Uh, one of the main concerns, and that was very surprising from this survey, is that uh, enterprise were very concerned next to denial of service attacks for traffic hijacking, that their sensitive information can leak and take unusual routes in the internet and therefore being subject to surveillance, for instance. And um, I think they did we'll also discover that uh, enterprise do not clearly realize the role of their service or connectivity provider can play in securing that particular part. So that was quite revealing. And uh, that's why we think that Manus can help also service providers to um, signal their security posture to their potential customers. So now that we've talked about re recognizing the role of the network in, in, in helping combat cyber attacks, what are the best ways to ensure maximum network security? And I know this could be just an open field, <laughs> trying to narrow this down, but um, from your perspective, Andre, what do you think? Well, I have to start that security is not a state. Uh, it, it's a process, right? If you treat security as a state and you uh, would go and patch your uh, software and you think you're secure, um, you may be disillusioned um, a few moments after, right? So you need to have a process that uh, continuous improvement, continuous security. Um, so another thing to consider that the level of security we need to achieve and maintain should reduce the risk to a successful attack to an acceptable level, right? We, 
you know, maximum security may not be cost efficient and may not even be needed. But what we're striving for is that risk is at this acceptable level, right? That doesn't mean that we take it easy and relax on the country. It means our job of security professional is never done. It also means that in such a system is the internet, we need to continuously do this risk assessment, understand new vulnerabilities and strive for collaboration. We shouldn't forget that such independent and hyper-connected system as the internet security is essentially a collaborative activity. Efforts, in my opinion, should be focused on supporting this collaboration and facilitating it, such as improving information sharing, transparency, accountability, this sort of stuff. Matthias, I'd like to ask you that same question. Uh, you know, is there a way that you think that we could ensure maximum network security? Yeah, no, I, I I really agree with Andre. It's 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 not an end state. It's it's a process and something that everyone needs to work on. We need to improve ourselves every day. But I think it's really as Andre said, it's a it's a combination of an ecosystem there. And I think that's where people have struggled. I think people felt, you know, in the past, you bought your security from a security company, uh, and then you felt safe. You know, I have I have everything I need from this fantastic security company, and I should be fine now. I think in the future, when both security companies are moving their stuff into the cloud to be even more efficient, uh, and people are using public internet much more for connecting various remote sites and so on, instead of having secure MPLS routes in the network, I think that the future networking is, is much more about a collaboration between, yeah, your service provider, connectivity provider that I represent, uh, security companies, then obviously internet societies that Andre represents who, who knows this and can guide people. And then of course the enterprise people themselves. And I think the future is much more collaboration, sharing of information, looking at, you know, okay, we've seen this type of attack right now. What can we do to, do to, to mitigate that type of attack? I think the days when you bought your entire security solution from a security company is over. Uh, everyone needs to do much more these days. And, and that's where a combination of a number of companies is a must for an enterprise. You can't just buy it from, from one. And we don't tell anyone that we are the complete security package either. We are not. Uh, we are one part of it and, and we can fix the network part or at least do, do as good as we can for the network part. But it's a combination of, of an ecosystem that's needed in the future really. I want to remind our viewers, if you have a question for our panelists or a comment, feel free to put your question in the Q&A box or just comment in the chat and we will get to that. We're gonna to get to some audience questions in just a moment. Uh, we're gonna continue our discussion, but I just wanted to do a quick reminder for those who might've joined us late. Um, so let me throw it back to you, Matthias. So we're talking about the future. You, you mentioned what, we're, what we may try expect, I guess, from some of these cyber attacks and the collaboration aspect, which is so key, can we get this under control or will it just continue to be so rampant? Um, what are your thoughts on that for the future? Yeah, no, I think that's the million dollar question. It's, it's a good question. And uh, I would love to say, yes, we can get them all under control and I really believe so, but we really need to work together. And I'm pretty sure crooks and criminals are not uh, sitting back. They're, they're probably inventing new ways of of doing these type of attacks. We've seen ransomware attacks have increased and then obviously that's when a lot of money is involved. Uh, if you can shut down a competitor, that's, that's also something where there's a lot of money involved. So I, I really hope that the entire industry are coming together to fight these type of security threats. Uh, I'm pretty sure they will never go away. Uh, hopefully over time we can control them so much but in, in some way, it's always down to this sort of, yeah, very last point. The weakest link is always the weakest link. And if not everyone is stepping up and, and behaving well, there are ways of getting into networks. I think, you know, uh, if we can really get everyone to understand that a combination of everything, uh, people, systems, providers, suppliers, I think that's what we need. Uh, I'm sure there will be cyber threats in the future as well but hopefully we can keep them under control. Uh, I really believe so, I hope so. Andre, how about you? Well, I'd like to share uh, Matthias' hope uh, and uh, um, think that yes, we need to 
continue our efforts. I think what we see also that this culture of security and collaboration is building up, at least in our experience with the MANUS effort, there is much more awareness of um, roles and uh, responsibilities of individual players or network operators in this ecosystem. So I think a norm building is very important because that uh, makes sort of uh, uh, undesired behavior or not, not, not meeting certain security standards, not just a matter of certification or being subjected to government regulation, but it's a social unacceptably to behave other way. And as you know, like a lot of things in the internet are done on interconnection, which is collaboration essentially, right? So this peer pressure and social acceptance plays probably even bigger role than any regulatory intervention or something like this. So I really hope that we as an industry can come together or continue coming together, discuss this and um, sort of, you know, police ourselves and make uh, the internet a safer place. We also need to look at security in perspective, right? Um, we can't just say, well, security is getting worse. We also need to, to, to look at the benefits, right? We also need to normalize those attacks by the size of the internet, by the um, uh, benefits it brings. So um, I'm not saying that the picture is, 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 uh, is bright, but I'm saying that that needs to be taken into perspective. Last thing is I, that also depends on the changes in the internet architecture. Some of the trends which may not be necessarily very positive, um, but they can contribute positively to security as well. Um, uh, for instance, you know that uh, cloud and content comes closer to um, end users, to customers, to edge networks. So the link, uh, what Matthias mentioned, the link or number of links between your source and destination it actually becomes short in the internet. Internet becomes a bit flatter and that makes security slightly um, less challenging or slightly more easier because you need to coordinate, you need to collaborate with less amount of parties than maybe before. But that also has side effects. I mean, the internet is, is getting more centralized, less distributed, and that causes other problems maybe not necessarily related to security. So that's my, again, not having crystal ball, um, uh, some deliberations. Thank you, Andre. Well, there is a lot to consider as you've been talking about from, you know, watching market trends and uh, collaboration and, um, you know, and protecting, protecting the enterprise. So where does someone start and how do they learn more? I'm gonna start I, I with- I think, you know, I think if I start there, I, I think there is a lot to learn. Uh, you can always, obviously call your service provider, connectivity provider and ask them how do they uh, take care of their network and, and how do we ensure that no one can enter our network and that any malicious traffic that we can see on the network is, is thrown away. I think that's a good start. Uh, but then there is, there is a lot of written material out there. There is a lot of guidance. I think uh, companies like the one Andre represents are a good source of information. You can just call them, ask them, you know, where should we start? You know, how do we start here? Uh, I think there are now uh, many good examples of companies that's turned around this in their advantage and, and went from a very unsecure company to a very secure company. Uh, I also think, you know, everyone that graduates from university right now have practically only lived in the internet era. Uh, Older people like myself, you know, I remember the old days when cyber threats didn't even exist. Uh, but I think everyone that comes from university right now are much more aware of this, uh, probably much, sometimes much more happy to click on things on the internet as well, which is dangerous. But I think, you know, the, the way and the more educated people that's going to come out, the more uh, educated everyone will be. So, but I think, you know, for an enterprise, I think they should really start by there is a lot of material out there. There's a lot of things you can read about. There's a lot of good examples of what companies have done. So don't be afraid of contacting your service provider or whoever and, and start your journey. Andre, what do you think? I know you're doing a lot of great work with the Internet Society. So where can um, folks start their journey to learn more and, and really be involved in, in, in protecting their data? So, uh, well, I mentioned this madness and uh, um, apologies for repeating this sort of shameless plug, but uh, <laughs> 
uh, our website of this initiative contains a lot of useful information. So that would be a good place to start. And Manus applies not only to um, service providers or transit operators like tele carrier, but also to enterprises. And I would say enterprise, of course, they have to uh, clean up their backyard. They need to um, take security or elevate security importance in their own priority list. Uh, but also we need to think how to engage, how to make market forces work in our favor. And in this respect, sort of selection of your connectivity provider, it's a two-way thing, right? If you uh, put security requirements as one of the essential components, you make your choice not only price, not only on maybe throughput, but also on how well your partner can be a security partner in this game. So realizing that I think can, can help us to overcome this you know, disconnect, uh, this externalities that I was mentioning before. Wonderful. Well, we do have a few questions from the audience that we're going to send to our panelists in just a moment. We've received those in our Q&A box. And if you have any additional questions while we're answering these, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box and we'll get to those uh, with as much time as we have left. And if we don't get to those, we'll get to our panelists to follow up with you directly. Okay, gentlemen, the first question we received from the audience is, could you speak about what steps Telia Carrier and Internet Society are taking to do their part in keeping the internet safe? Um, Andre, I know that you talked a lot about manners and we're gonna, we'll probably circle back to you in a moment, but Matthias, let's start with you first on this question. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. Um, no, we're actually, I, I think we're trying to step up and I know that uh, this year we have sold more of our DDoS service than ever before and I think that's important. I think many more companies are realizing how important that is. And of course, we need to improve that service as well. Uh, practically, a DDoS service that we are doing is looking for anomalies in the traffic pattern that we see in our network. And as the more traffic we have, the more we can learn from. Uh, but we also need to have many more scrubbing centers so we can take away the absolute largest DDoS attacks to protect our customers and so on. Uh, that's one thing we can do. Then there's, of course, a lot of other things we can do around our network, making sure that no one else can enter our network and no one else can access the routers and the, the equipment we have and so on. So I would say this year we've put extra focus on security and, and that's just going to continue into next year. Uh, but as a network provider, we're absolutely mostly focused on the network itself. And that's where the DDoS attacks is the ones we need to take away. Uh, if we can help the world by taking them away, we've done a big job for, for the internet to be a much safer place. Andre, how about you? You wanna address this question, the audience question about what uh, the Internet Society and Telia is doing to keep the internet safe? So I, at the beginning, I mentioned our mission and our mission is for open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy internet for everyone. And in the last two things, secure and trustworthy, we have two main projects for many years running, uh, focusing on those areas. We are not the network operator. So we are mostly focusing on, uh, you know, coordination and collaboration and, you know, mobilizing communities and solving this collective action problem. So one project that I've mentioned many times is MANAS, Mutually Agreed Norms for Routing Security, and Internet Society is acting sort of as secretariat, although this is a really industry-led initiative with telecarrier and other uh, leading operators uh, being part of it and gu guiding and, and driving this effort. Uh, another uh, effort is uh, encryption. So we are promoting end-to-end -end encryption and we are trying to um, uh, sort of criticize proposals that try to undermine end-to-end uh, -end encryption. And that's back lower to your question whether application is more important than network. And I said, all is important. And this is case in point where you need to secure your infrastructure, but also you need to secure your communication uh, sort of on application layer, right? What who could have been done without encryption, for instance, or what are end-to-end -end encryption? So those are two main pieces that Internet Society is contributing in the area of security. Okay, we do have another question from the audience. This one says, what types of cyber attacks do you think are gonna be most common in the future? I know that Andre, you don't have that crystal ball like you mentioned, but uh, do you have any thoughts to weigh in on what would be the most common cyber attacks that you know, is that they may develop and evolve over time and, and how we can prepare for them? So what do you think? 
Well, I think, in my opinion, the cheapest ones are volumetric uh, denial of service attacks and that, that sort of extortion and stuff like this, right? Um, uh, they, have, they can be very powerful. And especially with, uh, we know that um, Internet of Things and other connected devices, they're exploding in, in numbers, right? And they're not always as secure as we wish. So they provide a, a huge launch pad for those type of attacks. But I think the growth of more sophisticated attacks, um, um, we should expect, um, that's probably not something that we as sort of infrastructure providers can really do, but this, you know, advanced persistent threats, uh, um, attacks on national by nation states, which uh, create very sophisticated things. And the danger of this, that those things may spill over, they may reach this sort of, you know, common market, if you will. Uh, and we saw this as well, that those, a sort of weapons um, can get into hands of, of just, you know, um, simple hackers and be used. So I would watch this trend very carefully as well. Matthias, what do you think? What, what types of cyber attacks do you think will be most common in the future? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I'm, I'm almost afraid that we, if we would do redo this webinar in three years time, we would talk about things that we don't even know about today. Because it's really, as Andre said, the people are very creative out there, and there are many interesting objects online that that people people will still find uh, and still still be be sort of interested in attacking. Uh, I still think these phishing mails, you know, as long as people are stupid enough on clicking on mails, they shouldn't click on, uh, and I think they still do a lot, despite everyone warning everyone about opening things you're not knowing about. Uh, I think they will continue to be to be big. Uh, hopefully, someday people will be smart enough not to not to do that. But I, I'm just afraid that that's it's such a simple thing. Uh, you almost make an email look like another email, and and you get some some people to click on them. Uh, I'm just afraid that that's just going to continue. But it's really, as Andre said, you know, uh, if if everything becomes online, then there's some really scary stuff like weapons that can be reached the bubble and 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 yeah i i hope that's not going to happen but i'm afraid that might be the the next targets for these crazy people <laughs> okay well we have time for one more question and i think this one might go to you andre but also um matthias um if you want to weigh in as well but i know andre you mentioned the 451 research that was provided and a survey um and a lot of um um, research that went into um, at the Internet Society regarding cyber attacks and um, someone who joined wanted to know where they could access that information. I know we talked about, um, you know, how to get in touch with you, but more specifically that specific research or, or just information, where can they find that? Yeah, well, the simplest way is to go to the Manus website. It's manus.org. And um, uh, there is a tab resources and you can find different presentations and papers and this report I mentioned as well. And this report that has two parts. It has a, a look at the service providers, the transit operators, how, what menace means for them and also what menace could mean for enterprises. So yeah, please. And if you have more questions, you can always reach me. Matthias, um, go to the Telia Care website or where would you like to point some of our viewers? And and finding more no, I, yeah no i obviously the telia carrier website have a lot of we have a knowledge hub there where you can the report i referred to earlier in this conversation is of course downloadable at that point and, and hopefully you can get some other stuff there uh or some guidance but you can of course always contact us and we can guide you as well uh, in terms of that but that security report is is very interesting in in terms of how enterprises see the the future of security so please come Okay, well, thank you very much, Matthias and Andre, for your time today. A great conversation. We, we appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Thank Laura. you for having me. Thank you. And thank you, viewers, for joining us. Be sure to look out for our next virtual roundtable, and be sure to visit our YouTube channel to catch the recording of this and all of our past virtual events.